So a few years ago, I was flying to uh, Slovakia, and uh, I've told part of this story before, but I'm going to tell you the second half of it now. Uh, so I was flying to Slovakia, and I was sitting beside this, this lady in the plane, and she was 25 years of age, and we got talking, and so I was asking her, what, you know, was she in Ireland for a holiday or working or what? And she said, no, I work in, in Dublin. I said, oh, fantastic, right, what do you do? And she said, I'm, I'm involved in marketing. I work for a marketing company. And the question just came to me all of a sudden. <clears throat> I'd never really thought about this before. The question just came to me, and which I asked, which I duly asked her, uh, what would you do if you had to market the church? Because, I mean, in a way, <clears throat> as a priest, that's kind of what I have to do. Uh, like, all the truth is here. Everything we need to know is here. The problem isn't this. The problem isn't sacred scripture. The problem isn't all the teachings of the church that we have in the catechism. The problem is getting it out there. The problem is getting people to understand it and like it. You know, the problem is, is how we communicate the truth. But the truth is, the truth is there's nothing lacking here. But how we present it, that, that is problematic. Because if we don't put it across with conviction or with clarity, of course, people won't follow. So, yeah, how would you, how would you market the church? She gave two answers. I've spoken about one before, so I'll talk about the second one now. She said the first answer, sorry, the first thing that you must do in selling any product <clears throat> is that your product must have a unique selling point. In business industry, it's called, in marketing industry, it's called a USP, unique selling point. Uh, if your product has no unique, if there's nothing unique about it, why not buy the cheaper one? Or like, uh, yeah, very briefly, like the Volkswagen Group, they own Lamborghini, they own Seat, Volkswagen, Audi, and Bugatti. They're all owned by the same people. But none of those cars are competing with each other. All right, Skoda is in there as well. Uh, so you've got kind of entry-level cars, you've got cheaper cars, you've got farmer cars, you've got business exec cars, and then you've got football player cars. They're all kind of ridiculously expensive. But they're, and Lamborghini, did I mention Lamborghini? Uh, they're in there as well. So all these cars, but they don't compete against each other though. So that's how the market, that's how they've, they've been thought out, you know, your, and Seat, my goodness, they own everything. So your young drivers will, will get your Seats and your farmers will get your, 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 your Volkswagens and your Skodas, uh, your business execs will go for your Audis and your football players get your Lamborghinis. So point being, each of these sectors, right, they have a unique selling point. You get a Lamborghini because you're stinking rich, or at least you want to look it, right? You get, you get, you get a Volkswagen because you want a solid car to pull a trailer, you know, so, I mean, so like, they have different unique selling points. So she said, what's the unique selling point of the church? And I just thought, that is an absolutely fantastic question. Because in my limited time span of experience for the last 25-ish years, um, since I was in secondary school to now, it seems that in the church we've been hell-bent on, on teaching everyone that all faiths are the same, as long as you have some spirituality, it's fine. As long as you have a spirituality, as long as you believe in God, that's grand. You have some, something to put into that spiritual void, so that's fine, once you have something, because all religions are the same, effectively, which, of course, is complete rubbish, but this is what we've been teaching them. So then, is it any wonder why people won't associate with the Catholic Church, or people leave the Catholic Church? Why? Because well, it doesn't offer anything that... I mean, if, if, if all the religions are the same... I can also make up one. And the one I make up, obviously, is going to be much easier because I make up the rules. If I have to set my own homework and correct my own homework, I'm going to get straight A's. You know, like, so if on the other hand, I actually have to, there's a creed there, there are things that I have to raise my game to achieve, that's very different. Okay, so unique selling point. The second thing, this is a really long introduction, I'm very sorry. Um, the second point that she made was that... Uh, those who are selling your products have to believe it. Those who are selling your product have to believe it. So if you go into a Toyota garage and you're saying, well, I'm looking for, for a Toyota, and they say, well, yeah, yeah, we have this, um, this event that's here, but to be honest, across the road is a Ford garage, right? And they have a couple of Mondeos, solid, solid cars, right? I mean, not only, you'd be, you'd, be, you'd be, on one hand, you'd be like, thanks for the advice, but jeepers, I wouldn't hire you, like. You know, you'd be kind of, in a way, kind of grateful that maybe you're getting a better offer across the road, but at the same time, why are you trying to hang your own company? You know, it's just, it would be kind of strange. You'd be, you'd, be kind of, you'd be disappointed with them, in a way. I, I don't know, I think it would make them very untrustworthy. I don't know, like, you know, you go into a shop and they're telling you to go somewhere else to get the same thing for cheaper or for better. So we must believe the 
product and pardon the, 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 the marketing language, but we must believe the products that we're selling. We must believe in it. If we don't, it will be, it'll, it will be apparent. It, it will come across. You know, you, you see the way uh, certain uh, religious texts are written, uh, written at times, or you know, when maybe people uh, phrase prayers of the faithful, and you can see how it's written that they don't believe the Eucharist is important. They believe that once you believe in something, and have something to hug, be it a tree or a person or a stone, you're all good. You know, like... <laughs> Uh, you can see by the way these things are written what a person believes. It will come across. If I don't believe it, it'll come across in the way I speak and most especially in the way I live. Good. St. Thomas Aquinas today. That's, that's, that was the whole point. That's what I'm trying to get to. St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, it's not enough to be smart. Right? It's not enough just to know lots of things. Okay? No one ever got into heaven because of what they know. They got into heaven because of what they did. Okay? So knowledge of the faith you can know the catechism back to front. You can know Greek, Hebrew, and, and quote scripture, chapter and verse. That does not guarantee entrance into heaven at all. You can be an expert in St. John or any of the evangelists or St. Paul, the uh, quote by Pauline or whatever we call it in English, uh, letters of Paul. Um, you can be an absolute expert. <laughs> doesn't mean sanctity. Doesn't mean you live virtue. All right? So there's an awful lot more to our faith than just knowledge. So when we look at someone like St. Thomas, we don't say, wow, that guy was so smart, that's why he became a saint. No. His brains didn't make him a saint because that's not enough. All right? In fact, if anything, he didn't look very smart. Okay? Um, quick bit about St. Thomas. So uh, there were problems between the emperor and the, the pope at the time, and there was a bit of fighting about territory and land and things. And it seems St. Thomas Aquinas' family uh, were happy for little Tommy uh, to go to Monte Cassino, to the monastery there, knowing that, recognizing that, that he was definitely smarter than your average kid. Uh, they were hoping that he would go there and study and maybe with the help of God, one day become abbot because he was abbot. That also meant a certain amount of temporal power, okay? So he goes along uh, to, well, he's sent to Monte Cassino educate there and excels, but then the emperor was very unhappy with all of these students in Monte Cassino being so loyal to the Pope, so he disbanded the place. And uh, anyway, long story short, uh, St. Thomas then uh, comes across the Order of Preachers, the Dominicans, and is very, very taken by them and by their quest for the truth, their quest for the truth. And by, see, the Holy Spirit inspires charisms necessary for that time and something that was sorely lacking was was teaching in the faith so like who's going to kind of delve into scripture and delve into as, as saint thomas did delving into kind of philosophy as well and how to put terms on what we believe so what we believe is so often it's, it's quite mysterious but how, how can we without trying to encompass the mystery or undo the mystery how can we talk about it in terms that aren't wrong, that aren't heretical, you know? So how do we, how do we, how, how do we explain our faith? So the Dominicans, again, excel in this preaching and teaching, lots of study. And um, so St. Thomas wanted to join the Dominicans. That wasn't his parents' plan, or definitely wasn't his parents' plan that he would be sent to Paris. The Dominicans thought to send him to Paris, to keep him away from his family, knowing how interfering they were. So. They send him off to Paris, and on the way, he's abducted by his family, right? They abduct him, his own family, right? And they imprison him in a tower. And trying to get him, trying to dissuade him from being a Dominican, they send in a lady of ill repute, a lady of the night, um, and to tempt him, and so on and so forth. So what does good old St. Thomas do? Well, he does what any of us would do. He went over to the fire, he got out a big burning log and he threatened her with it, right? <laughs> so she duly left and he duly preserved the integrity, his corporal integrity. Great. So he was set out after a year and, uh, and uh, he, was, he, was, he was able to go to France where he studied. Uh, he also studied under St. Uh, Albert the Great, okay? Alberto Magno, and, uh, who was a, not, not, not just smart, but he was smart in, in so many fields at the same time, philosophy, theology, and the sciences. This fascinated St. Thomas and how, how there were, there were always been great desires in theology to come up with a system, 
a theological system, right? That explains, well, everything, right? So how philosophy and theology and creation, therefore the world, the, the, the world that exists, and then our ultimate destiny, eschatology, and how these things all come together, which is like, it's, it's fairly mind-blowing, like it's, it's, it's quite challenging to come up with, a, with a, a theological philosophical system that works, but anyway, St. Thomas was, was amazing, and he summarized this in his Summa Theologica, which is about yay big, a summary, <laughs> summary of his uh, theological notes, which actually it wasn't even complete. When he died, it wasn't finished. But astoundingly sharp mind, because obviously before he would start to say anything, he would define all of his terms. But then you have to keep in your head all of those definitions as you're writing and as you're expounding and how all these things link. You, you have to know the exact definition of these things so that you stay on track. You know, you have such a sharp mind. In seminary, I loved him and hated him at the same time because... <laughs> It's, it's quite as complex, like it's, but wonderful, like just incredible, wonderful. But when he was studying under St. Uh, Alberto Magno, uh, Al Al Albert the Great, um, he, was, he was quite, well, I mean, if he was a modern day student, he'd have been quite fond of the Nutella, you know, he was just a wee bit more on the huggable side, you know, <laughs> so uh, they had to apparently cut out a wee bit of his table so his grandeur could, <laughs> could sojourn. Uh, for a little, so um, yeah, so but because he was kind of quiet uh, and he was kind of like a good old fashioned farmer, saying not until you hear more, he was the kind of guy who who'd, he'd be listening and taking it all in and processing it, processing it. People got the impression that he was kind of stupid, so they called him the dumb ox, right? Because guy never says that, right? And he was kind of sitting there with his belly, and uh, so they called him the dumb ox. Uh, but little did they know, little did they see that this, this guy was uh, going to be one of the, 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 the pillars of theology in the Catholic Church and probably will be for, for centuries to come. I mean, this is the 13th century when he was there, 700 years ago. And we're still delving and, and rediscovering uh, over and over again uh, the depth of his writings. It's not enough that we know lots about the faith. That will never be enough. It's not enough for us priests, bishops, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that we know stuff. It doesn't matter that we have studied theology. What matters is what we put into practice. And in that way, some retired lady, some granny on an island somewhere, preparing daily meals, cleaning her house, praying her daily rosary, uniting her heart to God and all that she does can leave me for dust and sanctity. Because it, it's, not, it's not about how many books she has read or how much she knows. It's about her heart and how much she loves. And she could well love God more than I do. So when, when, we, when, we, when, we, when we know that and live that, this, this relationship with God, and not to be... It's good that we understand our faith, but we shouldn't be kind of running around in a kind of a panic. I have to know more, I have to know more, otherwise I won't be holy. No, that's... Holiness isn't... It's not a matter of the head. It's a matter of the heart. And if in my heart I, I, I love the Lord, and I, as I say, by all means, we, we, we do want to understand him, we do want to know scripture. But that on its own is not what guarantees sanctity. We must believe in this product that we have been given. Believe in the faith. Live for it. And die for it. So we ask the Lord today, to renew our faith, renew our love of him, renew our desire to put him in the first place. Amen. <laughs>